people can end up believing something so strongly that there's no evidence that can convince them that they're wrong. I mean, there's a friend of mine, uh, Stephen Law, a philosopher, he talks about this idea of intellectual black holes, the yeah. idea that there are certain belief systems that once you're on the inside of them, it's incredibly difficult to oh. get out. Uh, Chris, what can belief in the paranormal tell us about belief systems in general, whether they believe in religious views or political views? Um, and you describe this very well in, in your great book, The Science of Weird Shit, Why Our Minds Conjure the Paranormal. Oh, yeah, I think one of the things that I often would tell my postgraduates, because sometimes they were a little bit worried about oh, what kind of a job are they going to get next? What kind of position will they get if they've been doing all this paranormal stuff, will people take them seriously? And I would explain to them that there are ways of presenting these things, that what we're really interested in is the effects of belief on perception, on memory, on interpretation, on reasoning, and so on and so forth. And it just so happens that we've chosen paranormal belief. And there are good reasons for doing that. The, the reasons being that there's a nice spread of, of beliefs within society from complete scepticism up to complete unquestioning belief and all points in between, that these kind of beliefs for some people are a very, very central part of their, their core self-image, whereas for others, they're kind of quite peripheral. They don't really care one way or the other whether this stuff is, is, is for real or not. Um, they're often held with, with great emotional conviction. And so there, there are a lot of properties there of paranormal beliefs that made it great as a way of studying the effects of belief on things like memory, judgment, reasoning, and so on and so forth. Um, and the, and the, you know, the results would, would generalize. I mean, sometimes we would be looking at kind of research in other areas. I mean, the obvious examples would be things like religious beliefs, political beliefs, right. but even kind of, you know, which football team you support and the way that you kind of perceive a match. The classic studies where uh, you always see the other sides of, of, of being kind of dirtier players. They're more likely to foul than our good guys, you know. And again, it's these, it generalizes. So, yeah. Uh, and so if, um, if I were interested in studying religious belief or political belief, both of which in, in the U.S. are, are significant topics today, um, how would 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 your study of the paranormal be able to reflect on those things? I mean, what specific kinds of psychological tools or categories um, can you learn more from the paranormal in understanding the religious or political belief than from just studying the religious or political belief by itself? I wouldn't necessarily say that you can necess necessarily learn more. Uh, it's just a kind of um complementary approach uh, for for a long time uh people who self identified as skeptics certainly back from the early seven from mid 70s onwards for a couple of decades avoided religious topics and i think to some extent anomalistic psychology avoided religious topics but you can't <laughs> you just can't do it because some of the some of the subject matter of anomalistic psychology is inherently religious by nature. I mean, prime examples would be things like near death experiences. You know, the, the kind of spiritual figures that you feel you are meeting during the experiences is going to be influenced by your religion, um, and and you, you you just can't get away from it. I mean, obviously, any evidence relating to life after death has implications both for the parapsychology, the paranormal, and for religions, and so. Uh, anomalistic psychology by taking, if you like, a kind of more kind of scientific approach, for example, understanding the nature of sleep paralysis certainly explains a lot of beliefs about demons and so on. A lot of those kinds of accounts could well be explained in terms of sleep paralysis. That's not something that you necessarily would have come to by just studying the psychology of religion. And, and that's what I was trying to get at. What are the aspects of the paranormal that can highlight um, uh, facets of religious or political belief that uh, the paranormal would uh, tease apart, that would be hidden as a secondary or tertiary 
causation of, of belief systems in religion or politics, but the paranormal, because it brings that up strong, more strongly, can, can help us to to perceive that that underlying motivation. Again, I, mean, I think that the the approach of anomalistic psychology rather than parapsychology, because I mean, I'm first and foremost an anomalistic psychologist. Right. I'm not a parapsychologist. Um, but I mean, I think that greater appreciation of um, the kind of cognitive biases, the way our minds work. I mean, one uh, influential approach within the um, area of the psychology of religion talks about uh, intentionality. You know, or some, I mean, Michael Shermer calls it agenticity. But the idea that when something happens out in the world, it's because someone or something made it happen with particular that, and that whatever it was has particular intentions towards us. Now, that's an idea that has been put forward uh, as a as a possible explanation for a lot of religious concepts, but also clearly it applies to a lot of um, paranormal concepts, things like uh, belief in, in demons, in witches, in, in other kinds of supernatural beings. And so I think it's just a kind of it's, it's just a kind of a way of a, a different perspective. I think that different perspective is really important. I mean, let's just take it even further to political beliefs uh, in which uh, emotionality is, is a, a, and the valence of the emotional response. Uh, we see that in American politics now, which is the most divisive in our current lifetimes in terms of political views. Can you study that that deep emotional conviction in the paranormal is if somebody's had that experience, that emotion, that the valence of emotionality in that is very high. Well, that's right. I mean, and, and again, I think this, this kind of crops up particularly when it comes to topics like belief in conspiracy theories, which of course are really a very, very important part of, of, of American politics in particular, um, thanks to he who shall not be named, but um, you've, you've got that kind of situation where people can end up believing something so strongly that there's no evidence that can convince them that they're wrong. I mean, there's a friend of mine, uh, Stephen Law, a philosopher, he talks about this idea of intellectual black holes, <laughs> the idea that there are certain belief systems that once you're on the inside of them, it's incredibly difficult uh, to get out. Good, conspiracy good theory, analogy. Good, good analogy. Yeah. The prime example. Any any evidence that counts against the conspiracy has obviously been planted there by the conspirators. You don't need to take it seriously. <laughs> now, yeah, that, that's a particularly kind of uh, obvious example, I suppose. But but we all have this confirmation bias, and it crops up everywhere. It crops up, as I say, it crops up with respect to religious beliefs, political beliefs, even watching a football match. You know, it's, it, it's pervasive. We all have it. Uh, being aware of it doesn't, doesn't make it go away, but it might make you a little bit more aware that sometimes <laughs> your, your views and your beliefs and your experiences are kind of coloured by these kind of factors. Yeah, look, I should uh, confess my own belief system. And I gave you the story that I almost did a PhD with J.B. Ryan in parapsychology at, at Duke. So that's one side of it. But the other side of it is when I first was thinking about doing Closer to Truth and I consulted with three or four people, one of the people I one of the the the, the, the experts I consulted was was Paul Kurtz. Who was the founder of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, which, of course, you have supported. So I've been very much uh, uh, bimodally schizophrenic on the issue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, All right, look, let's let's uh, have some fun. And uh, I'm going to ask you a series of, of uh, questions. And the answer, my question may be a little bit long, but your question, but your answer has to be very short. And in general, it's a scale of zero to 100. Uh, of the likelihood of the following things I'm going to ask. And zero means impossible in principle, and 100 means uh, absolute certainty. Okay. So let's go through it, zero to 100, and see if we tease these things apart. So number one, these are some obvious questions, that there will be at least one instance of telepathy, mind reading, which will be impossible to explain by the current laws of physics, zero to 100. 10. Two, at least one instance of clairvoyance, sensing at a distance without the senses, will be impossible by the current laws of physics, 0 to 100. 10. 
So you're that, that that's the interesting part that you were equating the the likelihood of clairvoyance and telepathy. I for one would have made telepathy a little higher or clairvoyance a little lower telepathy i can sort of imagine a, me a mechanism clairvoyance is, is where i'm communicating with something non-mental yeah. seems a little harder all right number three uh at least one instance of precognition knowing the future will be impossible by the current laws of physics 10 Okay, so you're being consistent. I would not be so consistent, but okay. Four, at least one instance of psychokinesis, mind moving matter, will be impossible to explain by the current laws of physics. Five. There you are. A bit of variability. Okay, good. Plus. Uh, number five, parapsychology will become at some point recognized increasingly as a legitimate scientific field. I am unusual here. I think parapsychology at its best is a science, so but being recognized as a science is different. I'm going to say 80. Uh, so 80, it's a, it's an important distinction, which I, I, I didn't make. So 80 as a legitimate scientific field is, is a good answer. I'm whether it's it... Legitimate, yeah. And I think at best it's just as scientific as other areas. Science is a method. It's a methodology. Yeah. That, that's that's a great answer. It's not yeah. what I expected. That's a great answer. Uh, six. Uh, is consciousness entirely physical with nothing non-physical needed such that an advanced neuroscience will entirely explain our inner awareness? Zero to 100. 50. Good. Interesting. Completely on the fence. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, um, will AI ever become conscious as we are conscious? 70. 70. Okay. No, maybe, maybe that's too high. I'm going to go 50 again. Sorry. I think, yeah, I think, I, I think I'm, that, again, I'm on the fence yeah. on that one. Yeah, look, we all have different <laughs> opinions, and this is just snap judgments, but I, I would have six and seven conscious entirely physical and AI. I would have them very similar to the to, together. Uh, eight, uh, is virtual immortality possible in principle where our first person consciousness can be uploaded to another medium, not a clone, but actually you? Zero to 100. 25. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely be lower than a AI consciousness on, yeah. on that as well. I'd, I'd be even, I'd be even less, but, but okay. Uh, nine, uh, if you were to come, if you, if you were to come to believe, this is a counterfactual <laughs> question. If you would come to believe that consciousness does have non-material aspects, you said you're 50, 50. So in the 50 that you would come to believe that it does, would that give you more credence to the reality of paranormal events, zero to one hundred. Yeah, it would. Okay, okay, good, good. I, I, I would, I would be there. So now let's take that in reverse. If you were to become convinced that any paranormal events, any violate the current laws of physics, would that give you, would that give you more credence to consciousness being at least in part non-physical? Eighty. Eighty. Yeah. 11, possibility of life after death in a real sense, zero to 100. 20, 20. Oh, okay, interesting. I got, I got a little bit higher than the 10, you know. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, yeah, yeah, this is not designed to think too hard. <laughs> so uh, finally, and this, this you can give a, a little bit, a, a couple sentences if you like. Have your decades of investigating claims of, speaking to the dead or reincarnation or past lives has it affected at all your personal belief in the possibility of life after death yeah yes i think it has yeah i think it has i'm i'm kind of more convinced that there is not life after death than i would have been if i hadn't spent all that time looking so the it. results has been with all the data a, a, a negative you might have had yeah, a pre-sense yeah, yeah, yeah. that that but 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 having all this so-called evidence as you've investigated it uh, actually decreased your your, your yeah, sense yeah. of the reality okay yep. fair position appreciate okay thank you for watching if you like this video please like and comment below you can support closer to truth by subscribing Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. 
please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us and thanks for watching.